Hello again, fellow historians. In this lecture, we look at the Second Industrial Revolution, roughly between 1870 and 1914. That is on the heels of the Civil War, which we know ends in 1865 to World War I. A time of unprecedented technological growth in a way that hadn't been seen since, since the beginning of humankind, since the beginning of history. Um, in some ways, as we'll see, technology hadn't changed very much. In some ways, since the Romans. And then something amazing occurs in the 19th century that propels, because we're concerned with American history in this class, propels America into what will become a world power after World War II. The foundations are laid in the 19th century. The Second Industrial Revolution, 1870 to 1914. Here we have this famous picture of the completion of the first transcontinental railroad at Promontory, Utah, May 10th, 1869. This is four years after the end of the Civil War. And this really characterizes, I think, the, the unification of America, not just um, North and South, but East and West. America is now connected. Think about what it, what it took before the railroad connected San Francisco and New York. What it took for a young man, a young woman to um, travel from Boston, from Wisconsin, Missouri, all the way to California. There was two routes. Either they hopped a ship, a ship of Boston or New York and sailed all the way down to the tip of Argentina because the Panama Canal hadn't been made yet um, in the 19th century. Travel all the way down to the tip of Argentina and all the way up to San Francisco. Months journey, dangerous, very costly. If, and that was, for, that was for young people um, I say young people because that's mostly who made the track, but anyone who had a bit of money. If you didn't, you, you drove your wagon from the East Coast, from the Plains, all the way to California. And you better make it before winter hits, winter hit, or else you'd be stuck in the Sierra Nevadas and starve to death. Or like the Donner Party, have to eat your companions. So this is a famous picture that unites America. When the railroad connects America east to west, you can hop a train on the east coast um, for very little money, very cost effective, and travel safely um, in record time from New York, Boston, anywhere on the east coast to paradise, California where young people came by the thousands to make their fortune and new lives. Okay, here's a question. Just to give you an idea on the magnitude of the technological advancements taking place during the Second Industrial Revolution. Obviously, this is a wagon that's pulled by horses. You see the, the harness there. Where, what century is this from? What culture is this from? Take a guess, write it down, shout it out. I can't hear you, but go ahead, pretend you're in a classroom. What would be your guess? What century, what culture? 18th century? Oh, sorry, I should have done this before. What is this and what century is it from? Would you guess? A wagon from the 17th century? Go back further. A wagon from the 13th century, right, the early modern period, the hot, late Middle Ages. Further, let's hold it right there. Keep that thought. Where's this wagon from? We can, you can kind of tell because these actors are reenacting the time period. This is a colonial American wagon, 17th or 18th centuries. This is the kind of wagon that Perhaps the founding fathers would have driven him. Picture um, Madison, Washington, Jefferson, Hamilton in the back of this wagon. Not much different 
than this wagon. It looks it looks a little different, right? The the, the style, but basically the technology is the same. You have four wheels, and you have a wagon. It's pulled by horses. And I think many of you can guess what what these are. That these are wagons that are used across the prairies to come to California, nineteenth century. You can picture this full of a family leaving um, the East Coast and taking the Oregon Trail to Oregon country or California. 19th century American wagons crossing the plains. Pretty much the same technology, right? As this and as this wagon. Different style a little bit, but pretty much the same technology. Basic technology, four wheels, a chassis, a chassis and a wagon. And Two strong horses. Wells Fargo wagon, pretty ornate, really cool looking. Um, again, 19th century technology. Delivering uh, money and goods, well, money um, from the East Coast to the West Coast. 19th century Wells Fargo wagon. Let's go back to our first wagon. It's, this is the point here. Where is this from? This is a first century Roman wagon. Of course, it's a, it's a remake, a reproduction, but this is what a Roman would have driven in. Um, so the point is that in 2000 years, nearly 2000 years, 18th, 18 centuries, te te this technology had not changed at all. There might have been little pieces here and there, uh, but this, this Roman wagon looks really well put together, right? And in fact, other elements of Roman society, or, or sorry, Roman civilization, like the roads, weren't surpassed in many places in Europe until the 20th century. Um, highly advanced roads, um, engineering structures throughout Europe made by the Romans. But for, for nearly two, cent, two millennia, um, transportation, had not changed. The same wagons that the Germans used when they invaded Rome, um, invaded, you can call it invaded, you can call it um, invasions, but it was also immigration, right? When the Germans immigrated across the border into Roman territory, they used these wagons. The same wagons that pioneers used across the plains from the East Coast to the West Coast. The same wagons the Germans used 2,000 years before to cross from um, Germania, Germania into the Roman Empire. It hadn't changed at all. Then something amazing happens in the 19th century. This, these maps are amazing. I didn't make these maps, I pulled them off the web. Someone else made them, so. Um, but they, they are amazing. We see the progress of the second industrial revolution across America. Sorry, I'm getting more sad than that. Um, as, a, and this is, it's, as America pushes westward, the westward push from the East Coast to the West Coast. And of course, there's so much more happening here. We're not covering in this lecture, the war against the natives, slavery, the war in Mexico. Um, that's all happening at the same time. But for this lecture, uh, America is pushing westward, and they're able to do so in many ways because of new advances in technology allow them to do so. So 1830, um, the red lines are railroads. So 1830, we see in Pennsylvania, two little railroad lines, one in Maryland and Massachusetts. Um, most likely, these are connecting um, farms to marketplaces. Massachusetts, you see this little dot, it's probably connecting someone's farm to a port city, I mean Boston. But in 10 years, we see this great activity taking place across the East Coast, all the way to Mississippi, Illinois, um, Kentucky. These railroads are being built. South Carolina, North Carolina, Virginia, um, farmers and ranchers, um, I would say tobacco planters, cotton planters are taking their goods to ports to be delivered to northern um, 
manufacturing areas to be converted into textiles would be shipped to Europe. 1850, we see more flurry on construction of railroads. Bam, 1860, one year before the Civil War. Um, and I imagine these railroads, they look like arteries, don't they? America's coming in alive with technology. They, I envision these, like, these are like veins and America's pulsating with technology and becoming alive in the 19th century in a way it hadn't, it wasn't before. I like this railroad over in California. Look, take a look at California. We see a railroad up in the Sacramento area, um, most likely connecting some ranch or farm with the Delta that leads into the San Francisco Bay. So we see one railroad in California. This is 1860. Um, California is now a state. Um, some railroads in Texas. I almost said Los Angeles, Louisiana, um, and these arteries. Imagine them living, right? These arteries are reaching westward as America becomes alive with technology. Bam, 1870. 1870, California is connected, as we saw in the first picture, right? Um, the famous picture of the Transcontinental Railroad connected in Utah. Here it is. California, we have railroad systems down the San Francisco Bay Area going down the peninsula, down to what we was today San Jose area, up um, around Berkeley and Napa and Martinez, the North Valley connecting Sacramento, all through Nevada, Utah, where the railroad is connected, East Coast and West Coast, America is now connected. And there, there are, there's various stages throughout American history where America becomes more homogenous. The idea of America becomes more solidified. What is, what is America? America, what is it to be American? In, in some ways, um, before, before the 19th century, um, there are many Americas. Um, before the advent of modern technology, regionalism, I think was bigger, a bigger idea. And, and, and in some ways it really still is in America, right? I mean, America is a big country with many different types of people and ethnicities and backgrounds. And in some ways there are various Americas, but I think it was more highlighted perhaps in some ways, perhaps maybe not, before the advent of the second industrial revolution, where people identified first with their region and then as Americans. As the railroad pushes westward and connects um, Americans like never before, I think the idea of, Amer of being American is foremost um, above regionalism. Of course, I'm generalizing, right? There's so much more nuance than that. But I think, I think this railroad does connect America in that way, uh, mentally, uh, spiritually, uh, as Americans, foremost. 1880, you feel it pulsating, like blood rushing through, commerce, immigration, hop on that. You're a young person in New York, you hear that um, there's job opportunities in California uh, and there's great wealth to be had. You just gotta get in there and do your hard work. Pay a few bucks, you're on that train, you're headed, you're headed to San Francisco, you're headed to Fresno, you're headed to Los Angeles to make your fortune and live in paradise. And at this time, if you look at the postcards and read the booster pamphlets, um, boosters in California, city fathers and leaders are really um, showcasing California as paradise to try to entice East Coast migrants and from the Midwest also. This is what happens in Fresno. Um, I teach in Fresno, and uh, many of you who are watching this video um, are from the Fresno area. Um, this is what happens during this time period. Fresno is a result of the gold rush and the second industrial revolution. Also the Civil War. In 1870, the census for Fresno County um, was overwhelmingly from the Confederacy, around 78%. Of the, of the settlers living here in Fresno County in 1870, nearly 80% are from the Confederacy. Pretty amazing history. 
But here we see now 1880, the, um, the railroad is going through the Central Valley where I live. Um, Sacramento, Stockton, Modesto, Fresno, Bakersfield, down through Los Angeles, and down to Arizona. Wow, this is amazing, isn't it? Look at the growth. And I really want you to um, grasp this, how this occurs in only a few decades. So we looked at those, those wagons that hadn't changed in nearly 2,000 years. And we have this unprecedented growth that has never occurred in the history of humankind happening only a few decades. And we see it played out right here in front of our eyes in this graph of railroads from 1830, 1850, 1860, 1870, 1880, 1890. The nation is alive with commerce now. There's activity across the board, taking goods and services and people from town to city, city to state, state across the, from ocean to ocean. And people are traveling. They're discovering America. They're getting up and they're migrating from state to state and um, they're seeking their fortunes. 19th century factors that fueled the second industrial revolution. Number one, unprecedented urbanization and rapid territorial expansion, right? Another amazing factor of the 19th century um, after the American Revolution with it, under a hundred years, the United States goes from the original 13 colonies all the way to California. And of course, this involves much bloodshed. Um, I believe uh, the genocide in many places of American natives. Um, the conquering half of sovereign Mexican territory. Um, but the fact is, it's, it's an amazing growth period for the United States. Um, un I think, one of them, I don't want to say unparalleled in human history, but one of the greatest um, expansion stories in America, in, in, you, in a world history, is the westward push of the, of the, Amer of the United States from east, to, east coast to west coast. It's one of the most amazing expansions in human history. Um, and the, the Industrial Revolution, the Second Industrial Revolution, fuels this. Number two, territorial expansion, the annexation of Texas in 1845, the British retreat from Oregon country, and the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, 1848. This was the treaty that, um, that America and Mexico signed after the United States conquered half of Mexico. All set the stage for the second industrial revolution. So this great, America has this great territory now. Right, the Louisiana Purchase, the conquest of Mexico, and now the United States has doubled its size twice and owns everything from New York to San Francisco. That's all the United States. So you have this, this vast land. And what does this land include? America is so rich with natural resources. The U.S. possessed an abundance of natural resources from the newly acquired and conquered territories a growing supply of labor immigrating from Europe, right? The 19th century, as we'll see next week, my next lecture, 19th century immigration, um, millions of Europeans leave Europe due to varying factors that push them out of Europe and pull them to America. So we, uh, the United States has this great labor force that's willing to work for very cheap. And also um, the United States has this newly acquired conquered land um, that used to, that was at one time native land or Mexican land, but now is given to European immigrants and um, American citizens. The migration of African American free people north and west after the Civil War, the passage of the 13th Amendment, um, freeing African Americans from slavery, and expanding market for manufactured goods and the availability of capital for investment. Number four, American inventors and entrepreneurs. America was wide open, right? America is, Americans are free to think and free to invent without government control, without 
a dictatorship or a, a um, authoritarian government saying you cannot create that. Uh, America, it's wide open. Religion, religious freedom is wide open. Freedom of speech, freedom to invent whatever you wanted. Wide open space, wide open vistas, um, physical wide open vistas and, and mental wide open vistas. Right? This is a this is a time period where Americans are imagining great things for the future because they're pushing, they're pushing westward, they're pushing the limits, and um, there's great excitement as America grows westward. Not for all Americans, right? This is a time of, of hardship, um, poverty, um, child labor, Jim Crow laws. Um, Mexicans are being lynched along the border by the Texas Rangers. Um, all these things are occurring. Um, but for white Americans, for European immigrants, um, there's land to be had. There's fortunes to be made. Um, dreams are made. Um, not everyone acquires their dreams, of course, but it's a time of, of great imagination and invention and entrepreneurship. Major factors on U.S. society and culture. Companies grew ever larger, creating more corporations. Fortunes were amassed. And although real wage growth occurred in uh, many sectors, for most workers, wages were low for the common worker and working conditions poor. Um, this was a time before any types of workers' rights or safety laws. There were, there were no um, restrictions on the, the, how many hours a worker was made to work. And there were no standards for safety. Um, children who were five, six, seven years old were working in factories and getting their arms chopped off by machines. Rapid economic growth, the amassing of fortunes in the hands of a few industry leaders, greed, Little rights and wealth trickling down to workers granted this era the title, the Gilded Age. Number two, another major effect on US society and culture, Americans were now connected from coast to coast. Americans were connected. A new consumerism emerged around the railroad in the Sears mail order catalog. This is an amazing, the fundamental aspect during this time period. Before the railroad, if you were um, a, a woman living on the prairie, and you, um, hope I don't sound misogynistic, and you wanted to buy a new set of china, or just a new tablecloth for your table, how, how do you acquire those things? Well, you probably didn't, or your husband would have to drive you to the nearest town, Charleston, or whatever town there is close by, a couple days journey, um, or you just did without. You made things by hand, right? It was a hard life. Pioneers had hard lives. Now, you're in Sacramento, and the railroad is connecting you to New York, and there's a new company called Sears Roebuck, and they put out a catalog and that comes to your home and you open it and you can order anything you want. Sort of like eBay now, right? Or Amazon. This is the first Amazon in US society was a Sears Roebuck catalog. You can order anything you wanted and it was delivered to your railroad station, which is just down the street, maybe a couple miles from your homestead. You could even order a whole barn from the Sears Roebuck catalog. It came. You just, it was pre-fabricated, you just put it together. Amazing. A new consumerism is born because of the railroad system. Number four, rapid and increased urbanization. Fresno was founded and grew as a result of the second industrial revolution. Well, first of all, the gold rush, but the second industrial revolution really fueled um, the growth of Central Valley towns after the gold rush. The rise of the modern US city. This is the time when cities start to grow upward. New York, Chicago, 
San Francisco, Los Angeles. And number five, a massive migration of workers to urban areas. During this time, we see the first time in human history where there are more people living in cities than there are in rural areas. And this is a consequence of the second industrial revolution. America becomes urban. Major technological advances. Think of our lives without these things. Automatic signals, air brakes. Um, one of the fundamental elements advances during this time is a new way of creating steel, a stronger, more flexible steel that allows for the erection of skyscrapers. The Bessemer project, uh, process. The Bessemer and then the open hearth process in the steel mills, the telephone, the electric light, and typewriter. Think how amazing the telephone was when it first was invented. Well, of course, the telegraph was first, but the telephone, to be able to pick up a receiver and talk to someone across town, another state on the East Coast. Think about the first time that, that you were able to do that. There would have been a lot of people who thought that's witchcraft, that's Satanism. How can you, how can you hear a voice from 300 miles away? right? Amazing time. We take it for granted now, right? We have our cell phones, we have TV, uh, but for most of human history, hu humans didn't live this way. Think about electricity. It just, just electricity itself. How much our lives depend on electricity and how different our lives will be, would be if we did not have electricity in our life. Our life... Uh, we, I, I think we can't even imagine it, right? We, we'd be living on a farm um, like we did 500 years ago, 1,000 years ago. Just the idea of darkness. Right? If, if, you go, if you go camping, I go camping often. When that sun goes down, you're, after a couple of days, if you go camping for a week or two, after a couple of days, your body starts acclimating to sunlight and darkness. And when that sun starts going down, even though you have a campfire, you start getting sleepy. And for, the, for most of human history, up until very recently, when the sun went down, so did you. And there was a whole worldview surrounding the darkness, right? Superstition, what's in the dark, bad things. Electricity totally transforms our lives. We can, we can have light when the sun goes down. Amazing. Skyscrapers, the phonograph, motion pic, oh, Hollywood. Think about the movies and television and cars that have such a major impact about our lives. This all comes, these all come about as a result of the second industrial revolution. Completely transforms human existence in profound, deep ways. For thousands of years, humans had lived one way. There were, there were some, of course, there were many technological advances. The arrow became the crossbow, became the musket, right? There, was, there were technology, technological advances in, in shipwrights and building ships that allowed Europeans and the Chinese to have technology to sail around the world in the early modern period. But for the most part, for thousands and thousands and thousands of years, humans lived the same way. In their village, didn't travel very far. You married the person next door. You died when you were 35. Your teeth fell out at 30. Really, if we had to go back in time and live, we would be horrified by the way humans lived throughout most of history. Even <laughs> if you were to go to New York to if you went back to New York 200 years ago, you'd be horrified. Before modern plumbing, before the great push, the great hygienic push. Imagine walking through New York and there's crap in the streets everywhere. There's no sewage system. The sewage are the sidewalks and gutter. When, when you wake up, when people wake up at, in the morning, you, you get your bucket, that your, um, your honey pot that you use the restroom in, you open your window and throw your, your poop out into the street. 
And God forbid you're a person walking underneath that window. This was human existence. Living, living alongside pigs and goats and crap for most of human history. <laughs> Planes, railroads, a great hygienic push, modern medicine, all these things transform our lives during this time period. I'm not gonna make you memorize all this. Um, just know, know the major ones, right? Um, the telephone, 1876. Alexander Graham Bell invented a device called a telephone. Of course, there's an evolution. Most of these aren't the first, but they're the most famous and they're, they're people who perfected these inventions. The Gatling gun, the first automatic machine gun, 1862, makes its way into the Civil War. Edison. Edison Company, 1891, successfully demonstrated the kinetoscope, which enabled one person at a time to view moving pictures. Wow. The film industry will revolutionize American or have a great Im impact on American culture, right? How many of our lives are impacted by Hollywood, movie stars, movies? I know I was when I was a kid, Star Wars, that was my whole life. <laughs> For the first 10 years of my life, I thought I was Darth Vader. Every day I'd go play, I was Darth Vader. I mean, it's just, this, all, this is all a consequence of the second industrial revolution. The car, how many of you could not live without your car? The car is a product of the second industrial revolution. Here's a quote um, by a Stanford historian, Richard White. Um, it's, it's, it's a great quote about this time period. If a Western Rip Van Winkle had fallen asleep in 1869 and awakened in 1896, only three decades, right? He would not have recognized the lands that the railroads had touched. Bison had yielded to cattle. Mountains had been blasted and bored. Great swaths of land that had once whispered grass now screamed corn and wheat. Nation states had conquered Indian peoples, slaughtering some of them and confining and controlling most of them. Population had increased across much of this vast region and there were growing cities along its edges. A land that had once run largely north-south now ran east-west. Each change could have been traced back to the railroads. Powerful, I just got goosebumps, but I'm kind of weird when it comes to history. <laughs> Powerful quote by Richard White, Stanford historian, uh, a historian of the West. Um, but yeah, in three decades, America, especially the West, is completely transformed. And for those who, of you living in Central Valley like I am, um, Fresno, this definitely pertains to Fresno. Um, before the Second Industrial Revolution, the valley, Fresno County, was grasslands. Um, desert environment, um, weather pattern, but not desert as in sand, just a dry, dry grassland area with some swampy regions. Um, herd, herds of wild elk, herds of wild horses left over from the Spanish days. Grizzly, not only in the mountains, but grizzly all over the valley. Um, this, the San Joaquin River, most of you know what Lost Lake is. It's, like, it's not really a lake, it's more like a creek. At one time, that was a raging river that led to the, the ocean. If you stand in back of Woodward Park and look at the bluffs, um, those, that was the edge of, of the San Joaquin River. That's how high and deep it was. Um, steamboats from the Bay Area would come to this area. Large salmon, bald eagles, grizzly, um, completely transformed by the pioneers coming westward. The landscape was completely transformed. The wildlife killed off. Grizzlies became extinct. Wild elk are extinct. Um, the salmon are extinct. Bald eagles no more in the valley. All that wildlife was eradicated and the landscape was transformed, all as a consequence of the Second Industrial Revolution. The river was dammed to, 
to transform the valley into an agricultural paradise. The largest lake this side of the Mississippi, larger than Lake Tahoe, was in Tulare County, called Lake Tulare, where 10,000 Yokut Indians lived for 10,000 years. When the pioneers came, they drained the swamp and killed the natives off. And that didn't happen very long ago. It happened during the Second Industrial Revolution. And this is an amazing painting that I use in many of my classes. As I went over in my first um, lecture, what is history, the primary artifact for the historian is the, the written word. But we also use other documents, other um, sources. And I believe this painting called American Progress, painted by John Gass in 1872, is really an, an awesome window into the time period, into the westward push of America. And Richard's, Richard White's quote is really encapsulated here in this painting. Now, I want you just to um, perhaps stop this video for 10 or 15 minutes, because this will be in your test. Stop this video 10 or 15 minutes, and I want you to take out a piece of paper, and I want you to describe everything you see happening in this painting. In fact, this is what I have students do um, when I give this in a regular classroom environment. Um, is take out a piece of paper, spend about 15 minutes um, examining, analyzing this painting and what it means. Every element in this painting means something. It's not just a pretty picture um, of a landscape, but everything is meant, everything has meaning. And for those living in Fresno, this, this could be the Central Valley. Here are grizzlies, here are wild elk on the bottom right. the Sierra Nevadas, but this is, a, this is a westward push across America. So stop the video, take some time, write out your descriptions. And um, the next few slides are detailed images of each of like, parts of this painting. Go through these. Write down what you see. So I hope you spend about 15 minutes examining American progress. The next few figures I want you to know for the test. Um, important second industrial revolution, revolution, yeah, revolution, sorry. It's late um, since the quarantine. I've been working until midnight, two o'clock in the morning. So forgive me if I talk too fast, I know I am, or if I make mistakes because I'm working overtime. <laughs> Thomas Edison. So the Second Industrial Revolution also coincides or parallels 19th century immigration. So many of these people are immigrants. Not him, but others are. Born in Ohio, died in New Jersey. Amazing inventor, and American businessman. Alexander Graham Bell was an immigrant from Edinburgh, um, Scottish, right, Scots. Alexander Graham Bell was a Scottish-born scientist, inventor, engineer, and innovator who was credited with patenting the first practical telephone in 1876. This is 11 years after the Civil War. And I believe the year that Fresno was founded. And founding, founding um, father, or founding the, the Bell Telephone Company in 1877. There he is, a young man with his family, and is an older gentleman. Andrew Carnegie. Andrew Carnegie was a Scottish American industrialist, also um, a Scottish immigrant, business magnate, and philanthropist. That means he gave away his money as he got older um, to worthy causes. And he built many libraries throughout California. Fresno had one. Fresno had, Fresno had a beautiful Carnegie library, but it was torn down, unfortunately. Many communities, I think especially in the Bay Area, still have their Carnegie libraries. Google it. Um, beautiful Art Deco buildings. And Fresno's, was, Fresno had a beautiful Art Deco Carnegie library. Hanford has one, and over the last year, there's been um, debate on whether to tear it down. And I'm not up to date if they have torn it down already, but there was debate last year, unfortunately. 
Carnegie led the expansion of the American steel industry in the late 19th century. By 1889, he owned Carnegie Steel Corporation, the largest of its kind in the world. In 1901, he sold his business and dedicated his time to expanding his philanthropic work. So we know if we break that word down into its Greek parts, philios means love, right? Anthro means men, or in this case, humans. So uh, a love of mankind. So philanthropic work is um, a love of mankind, giving your money um, to worthy causes, including the establishment of Carnegie Mellon University in 1904. Henry Ford. Henry Ford did not invent um, the automobile. He invented a great system, a, a, a system for cranking out automobiles. He created um, a factory system. Henry Ford was an American captain of industry and business magnate, the founder of the Ford Motor Company and the sponsor of the development of the assembly line technique of mass production, right? The assembly line where you have this assembly line um, and each person on that line is responsible for placing something new, different on the car as it goes along. So at the end of the line, you have a completely manufactured car. Invented the Ford Model T, aka also known as a Tin Lizzie. Let's ask these questions of ourselves. What technologies rooted in the second industrial revolution have transformed our lives? Think about your life. What technologies do you have that come from the second revol industrial revolution that have transformed your life? Question number two. What did it mean for America to have both coasts connected through the railroad system? Think about these things. In what ways were regional communities changed by the second industrial revolution? Number four, how was the second industrial revolution transformed? How has the second industrial revolution transformed American culture? Sit back and think about these questions. Here are some great pictures of, of Model T's in the early 20th century. Think about how the car, how these Model T's transformed the lives of Americans. Henry Ford made the automobile affordable for working Americans. So say you're from Fresno before the Model T, before Henry Ford came on the scene. How, did, how long would it take for you, you to get from Fresno to Monterey? Fresno to the Bay Area? Fresno, Los Angeles before the, the car? Couple days, right? You have a car, your friends jump in, you're in Monterey in three or four hours. The road trip. America, Americans love their cars. Americans love the open road. The idea of the road trip comes from America. Vacations, piling the family in and taking off on the open road. This is where America begins its obsession and love affair with the car, right? Think about the different car cultures that have come out in the later 20th century. Hot rods, low riders, monster trucks. You can think of uh, lots of different car cultures that have come from America the other cultures or other societies around the world copy. They come from, most of them come from California, right? Low riders, hot rods, um, monster trucks. I think most of those things um, first are created in California. I love these old pictures. They're going on a trip, aren't they? leaving their farm, going to go to the city maybe, or the coast, going to the beach. Businessman, got his cigar, hitting the open road. Ambulance drivers, 
the Second Industrial Revolution transforms the American army. And of course, one of the, the features of the Second Industrial Revolution is that um, children are working in factories. Here's a sign for small boys apply first floor. Boy wanted. Because children have little hands, they're able to um, use certain machines that adults have a hard time using. These are breaker boys. Um, they work in the coal mines, Pennsylvania, 1900. We're gonna take a closer look at their faces. They look older than you would, they probably are. You can imagine, right? They're probably eight, nine, 10 years old. What were you doing at eight, nine, 10 years old? I was playing Nintendo. Think about the great uh, um, effects that working this hard has in a, a small boy's body. In some ways, these are men already, even though they're boys. What do you see when you look in their eyes? Do you see a bunch of eight-year-olds? 10-year-olds? In some ways, they look like hardened men, don't they? So this is one of the features of the Second Industrial Revolution is um, wealth is being concentrated in the hands of a few, and certain sectors are seeing rise, rises in wages. But for a great many Americans who are working in factories like these young men, it's, it's a very hard life. In, industrialization and urbanization pull people from farms and ranches, from a lifestyle that humans have lived for thousands of years, hundreds of years, into these these work areas that in some ways drain the humanity out of them, these young boys. Only one feature of the second industrial revolution. Small girls working in factories. Their hands are nimble, but many of them become injured, maimed, lose their lives working in factories in unsafe conditions. I'm guessing maybe 12 years old and 16, but she looks like she has a care of the world on her shoulders and her eyes, doesn't she? I can imagine she lives a very hard life. These girls look tough. It's like the breaker boys we saw. Um, in some ways, these are hardened women in the, in, their souls are hard to women living in the bodies of young girls. Maybe 11 years old, 12. Um, maybe the soul of a 45 year old, 50 year old. It's like a pretty tough girl. What do her, her eyes say? Distrust. She's seen a few things in her life, right? So it's probably ugly. Again, hard looking faces. In a, in a child labor um, pamphlet. I want you to, this will, this will be in the test, but this is an amazing video. Um, type in San Francisco Market Street, 1906, and watch this video. This video actually was taken um, a few days before the major earthquake. And it's an amazing video that shows um, San Francisco at, um, during the height of the second industrial revolution. And there, there are wagons, there are horses, they're Model Ts. There are no stop signs, no stop signals. It's, it looks so chaotic. You think there's going to be an accident every any moment. Um, and the video is on 
a trolley, and it's going down all the way down Market Street, all the way down to the wharf. And it's an amazing video. Please watch it. Um, you won't be disappointed. It's about 10 minutes long. Well, that concludes our lecture on the Second Industrial Revolution. I hope by now, after watching a couple of my lectures, you see that history is more than just a, a memorization of dates and facts, memorization of people, but it really is about the human experience. When we look at the Second Industrial Revolution, and we imagine what life was like before these great technological advances, and how human lives were changed by technology. I think that gives us a greater insight into this time period than just merely a memorization of dates to pass a test. The human experience, the human drama is what um, history is about.